Hello everybody, I'm Mark Tabor. This is uh, Kevin DeMazen. We just both graduated from St. Louis University um, with our bachelor's in computer science, so please not too hard questions. <laughs> um, so what we worked on was a project between the English department and the computer uh, science department at SLU. The English goal was they wanted to find time inside text, uh, specifically early English text. Computer science goal was to utilize this as a chance to teach uh, undergraduates machine learning and natural language processing techniques. Um, to talk further about the English goal, there was a writer in the 18th century named Thomas Chatterson, and he took on the persona of a 15th century monk and wrote a bunch of medieval poetry. So he, uh, his fellow writers during the time argued of whether or not uh, Thomas Raleigh, the monk persona that he had, was actually a monk or not. And there's actually a lot of work uh, during that time to support that these works were actually valid. So one of the things they want to do is analyze those texts and see, do they actually classify as 15th century texts or are they going to classify as 18th century texts? Um, so the first way we went about analyzing the text was we want to do an unsupervised machine learning technique. So a really simple one is k-means clustering where you take, uh, you select a K, which is how many categories that you believe there are. Then you pick uh, initial centroids, which are average uh, uh, texts. And then you calculate the distance between every text in uh, your corpus and partition your set uh, to the centroids. You recalculate those centroids and see how everything changes. You do that until the partitions remain constant. What we found was that time signal is not a strong enough uh, indicator to actually uh, get k-means without to do a lot of pre-processing. Uh, what we found was language and then after language you have author and then genre and stuff like those. So we moved on to a supervised learning technique um, in Naive Bayes. So just the simplest explanation of Naive Bayes that you can have. You want to find, uh, so what we wanted to find was the max probability of time given a text um, but what we start with is the probability of a word given time and the probability of time. So using Bayes' law, uh, you can turn that around. And uh, one of the uh, notable things that we did, which a lot of people don't, is we used information gain instead of TF, IDF to do feature selection. And uh, we got our information gain from this work, cross-domain feature selection written by Marco Liu and uh, Timothy Baldwin in 2011. And essentially what information gain is, you calculate the Shannon entropy of a system, um, and then you calculate the Shannon entropy uh, holding a word constant. The uh, Shannon entropy is the average number of bits it takes to encode a system. So if you have a very simple system, like heads and tails, you have two equally probable things, it takes one bit of information to encode that. Four things will take two bits, so on and so forth. So if we have a system that takes four bits to encode it, and you hold something constant, and it com becomes completely deterministic that you know exactly what's going to happen, that gives you a lot of information. So IG is the entropy of the system minus the entropy given a feature. Uh, so some data. Here's our info game list. We have uh, 12 classifications of decades between uh, uh, 1579 and before up to 1700 and after, or 1690 and after. So you can see the word that has the most information is will, spelled with a Y. And the reason why that's the case is it almost always occurs in that first 1579 and before category. And then um, if you look at the other words, we have should, uh, would, hurt, thing, all these words are spelled with I or Y instead of I, and a lot of them have E's at the end. And this really uh, went out of favor in the 1600s. So those words have a lot of time uh, signal inside of them. And then further, if we look at will, uh, one of the things we do is cross domain. So we compare it. Uh, what we don't want is a word that only shows up in one text inside of a class. So we do uh, an average where we take the proportion of a word as it appears in the class. So you see will here um, appears almost in every single text in the before 1579 category. So this uh, pulls out words that would be non-characteristic 
And the example that we have is what we call the Romeo example. If you're trying to classify uh, Shakespeare and uh, another writer of the time period, if the word Romeo showed up, it's almost certainly going to classify to Shakespeare, even though he only used Romeo in Romeo and Juliet. So if it appears in a preface or a thank you to someone named Romeo, that word is going to give you a lot more uh, sway than it really should. So doing cross-domain information gain pulls that out of there. Uh, so with our classification, using 1% of the data, we uh, were able to classify to a 60% accuracy. So you can see our confusion matrix here, and along the trace, our correct classifications. And you can also see the classifications that we generally got wrong were a decade or two before or after. So even though we only had a 60% accuracy, a lot of those were really close to their time period. <coughs> uh, the future for the project, our English grads at SLU, uh, Lauren Kersey, Jeff Brewer, Seth Strickland, they're going to continue this work for their master's and PhD. Um, and what they're working on right now is selecting the corpus and ensuring that the texts are properly distributed. Uh, SLU will continue to recruit <coughs> undergrads to continue to build these tools for them. And this is open source, it's all on GitHub, so if anybody wants to contribute, we'd love to have that. Uh, why did we pick Julia? Well, uh, generally, digital humanities is done with R and it's done with Python, but Julia is faster than those languages. It has that console like R and Python does, so you can do uh, on the fly requests, and there's really no walls to the code. And most uh, importantly, I read about Julia and went around to everybody and said, we should really do this in Julia. <laughs> Frustrations. Um, one, we uh, learn a lot of object-oriented. So the fact that there was no inheritance kind of threw us off originally. Uh, the fact that there's no encapsulation, there's some data and we built some wrappers that we don't want the English people to get access to. And even I found myself <coughs> modifying different types in ways that I shouldn't. So if we could privatize data for different types, that would be really helpful. Um, you can't overload the operator equal. So doing in place uh, addition and different operations becomes really tedious. You can build other classes, which would be nice if you just overload uh, plus equals. Uh, there was just a sparse matrix talk, and there's a lot of work being done on sparse matrices. But with NLP and with us, uh, just to give you an example, uh, average text is about 1,000 words. And with just 1% of the text, there's 2 million different words. So this is an extremely sparse space. So having sparse matrix or better sparse matrix support would be great. And then uh, <clears throat> lastly, some of the libraries aren't well maintained. I tried to contribute to the data structures. Um, they have the tree type, and it's not being exported. So I just made a simple pull request to uh, put it in the module. And then it's still sitting there three months later. Um, lastly, I'd just like to uh, give a shout out to our blog. And there's uh, two podcasts up there if you want to listen to more. They're each, I think the one's 50 minutes and one's half an hour. Um, and if you have any questions. Um, what is the state of feature extraction in Julia, say, compared to other languages like Python? Well, there's the one really big package that um, does this work. Be like, we're just uh, just started doing this for the past six months. But there's another package called textanalysis.jl. Um, and that was, there was a ton of work done there. But when we started to do this work, it had been left in an abandoned state. But I uh, talked to John, John Miles White, and he said that he's passing that package on to another programmer. So. Um, beyond that, I wouldn't be, really be able to tell you. Any other questions? Chatterton was deliberately impersonating 15th century monk. Yes. Could he have used 15th century spellings? He could have. Um, I'm not an English major. This is the example we gave. But what they really want to do is they want to use computational, computational techniques and say, does the computer classify these works? as 15th century, even though he mimicked their spelling or whatever, or would have classified 18th century. Um, and they want to do works with, one, orthographical, which is leaving the spelling the same. And then second, uh, lexicographical, where you standardize all spelling and see 
what words are archaic and what words become uh, neologic, and so on and so forth. Okay. Thank you very much.